701. Well, welcome to All Space Considered, everyone. I'm Dr. David Wright. So sorry about that little bit of a shaky start. Well, welcome to everybody in our theater. And welcome to everyone at our YouTube audience at home. And again, sorry for the slightly shaky start. Um, whether my fingers are pushing buttons on the remote and I don't realize I'm doing it, but it forwarded like three slides, though, which was weird. That's a really weird thing to do. I understand why. <laughs> anyway, so sorry for a little hiccup there, but I hope you enjoyed that opening video. Um, as you see, the uh, content of the video, the subject matter, is about our guests tonight, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. And the music was composed by our very own Theater Tech Hannah, who did a wonderful job, and the video created by Bill, and um, it was really great. Um, tonight, we are having All Space Considered, of course. It is on the third Thursday of each month, except when it's not, like <laughs> next month. Um, it will be on the second Thursday, so you kind of set your calendars by it not. No, um, it's I'm a day. Not. Every time it's a day that ends in Y. Yes. Every time. Yeah, it'll end in Y. We can guarantee that much. Consistency. Yeah. So this is why our, our anyhow. Um, but we, we're happy to be back live in the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon Theater here at yes. Griffith Observatory. And our program is brought to you by the City of Los Angeles, the Department of Recreation and Parks, and of course, Griffith Observatory brings you this program. And we like to thank our nonprofit, our exclusive nonprofit partner, the Griffith Observatory Foundation, um, who helps us make programs like this possible. So um, anyway, we, tonight we've got a great show for you. Um, we're going to be talking about some sun stories. We have, well, we don't have a sky report tonight. I'm not sure why Bill put that in there. He thought we might have one, but we don't have time because we have two guests. And uh, Vanessa, who normally does our sky report, is going to give us a report, but about our instruments here at Griffith Observatory that we observe the sun. So we'll still get to hear from Vanessa. Um, we will talk, we will hear from one of our museum guides, Laura May Abron, who's also a science communicator and um, went to Iceland and is going to talk about the fires of Iceland. And then our other special guest, Professor um, Joshua Wynn from Princeton, is going to talk about strange new worlds, and I'll introduce him um, when we get a chance, uh, when we get to his part of the show. But tonight I want to introduce the panel that's going to be talking about the sun with me tonight. Um, we have Sarah Vincent with us, who um, you all know, and of course Vanessa is with us. Um, Chris, another familiar face, Chris Butler. Hi, so folks. we're all going to be bringing you the sun section, a brief little section about the sun, um, and then we'll t turn it over to our guests. So, but before we do, I want to talk about an opportunity we have with Griffith <laughs> Observatory Foundation, our nonprofit partner, we're talking about the sun tonight. Well, our foundation has an opportunity for you to go see a total solar eclipse. In fact, we just had a partial eclipse. It's kind of cool, but a partial eclipse is a little bit like somebody telling you what it's like to eat chocolate yeah. cake versus getting to eat the chocolate Totals cake. Totals are different. So Totals are different. Yeah, it's completely yeah. different. Um, you need to get to a total eclipse. Now, you have yeah. a couple of opportunities. You can go to Mexico and, well, take a screenshot of this or memorize it, folks out there. <laughs> or just go to our webpage. You can see this there. You can go to Mexico with our very own observatory director, Dr. Dr. Edwin C. Krupp. And, I mean, I wanted to go on this trip all the way up until they invited me to lead the trip to Texas. So you have two different trips you can go on. You can join our observatory director in Mexico, or you can join me in Texas and come, come join on the, the Eclipse trip with us and uh, check it out on our website and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Now, eclipses, of course, you get images like this. We set up telescopes, we have white light filters on them, and we can see things like sunspots that we're seeing there. Great fun. But here at Griffith Observatory, we see stuff like this all the time. Um, how many of you saw, saw the sun last week? Last well, week? Yeah. 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 Any, anybody in our audience, did you see the sun today before it set? Today on, on the bus. On the bus. Nice. Okay, well, you sat outside the window, but you didn't see a, a, a magnified view where you can see these things called sunspots. They're these dark little... Magnified. Yeah. Well, oh, you did see it magnified? It was very bright. Okay, well, it was very bright. The sun has Be careful bright. with that. Right. Yeah. Don't stare at the un, unfiltered sun. It's not a good idea. I'm not encouraging you to do that. Yeah. None of our viewers would do that because if they do, they won't be viewing us anymore. Exactly. They won't be viewing for long. Um, but these sunspots that we're seeing on our instrument here at Griffith Observatory, or if you have a magnified view through a telescope, they are not always there. Sometimes there's a lot of them, sometimes there's not. And it turns out they're a magnetic phenomena. These are sort of magnetic field lines that have been drawn on there. And you can think back to sort of a bar magnet where the lines come out and they go back in the other end. That's kind of what's happening here, except this looks pretty messy. 
This isn't like a nice, you know, bar mm. magnet. Anybody play with iron filings? Anybody in the audience? Have you ever oh, done yeah. that? Yeah, drew the, the little magnet. face sure. on the guy. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you draw the face on the guy and you move around. But you can also just put a bar magnet there and shake them, and it'll show those magnetic field lines. Well, it turns out sunspots come in pairs usually, and one is like a north pole of the magnet, one is the south pole, and the field lines go in between the two. So that's telling us something about what's going on. And that actually has to do with this solar minimum and solar maximum. Like I told you, sometimes the sun has lots of spots and sometimes it doesn't yeah. have very many. Well, they come <laughs> and go in a cycle. It's about every 11 years on average. Sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's you know, 12 or 13. But it's on 11 or so on average that you get lots of spots and then not very many. Lots of spots, not very many. Now notice, this chart <laughs> goes all the way back to the 1800s. So this has been something that's been consistently going on for a pretty long time. And we believe it has to do with the fact that the, the magnetic field of the sun winds up. The equator rotates faster mm -hmm. than the poles do. That's, right. it's, it's not a solid object, so you could do that. The Earth can't do this, of course. Um, and I have a really awful video here that I, I, I like, but it's awful. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Um, anyway, showing that the middle actually is rotating a little faster and those magnetic field lines get dragged along with it and they start to sort of twist up and pop out of the surface of the sun. And that's kind of what's causing these <laughs> magnetic storms, these dark spots. And keep in mind, those spots are bigger than the entire Earth. Earth is 100 times smaller than the sun, 109. Um, but anyway, so these spots you're seeing are much, much bigger than that. Now this magnetic field gets all twisted up and every 11 years it flips direction. So in 2010, the north was, well, I don't know if it was up or down, but in <laughs> 2017, it went the other way around. Um, so it's, it, it, it'll flip and change direction every 11 years. So it's really a 22-year cycle to go from north to south to back to north. So it's right. very, very long. And we don't understand everything that's driving this, unfortunately. But you can see, you don't always get the same number of sunspots either. Right. Sometimes there's lots, sometimes there's fewer. So 1970, pretty good year. 80, a really good peak there. In the 90s, another, there were tons of them. I remember seeing naked eye sunspots in the 90s. Um, okay, there was a thick layer of fog and I was looking through sunglasses and I shouldn't have looked with my naked eye. No. But you look up at the sun and you see a spot on it, it's pretty weird. It's pretty mm -hmm. freaky. And so really big sunspots you can see yeah. with your naked eye, but I recommend you get the eclipse glasses. Don't do what I did. I'm partially <laughs> blind due to it. Um, you probably. We're over here. I should have. I should have. But people have done that. People will notice you're driving along and through a thick layer of fog and through your windshield with your glasses. It's, it's not a good idea, but it's not the worst. Um, anyway. Um, Don't do it. But here at Greenville Observatory, we have a way to observe the sun. And so, really? Vanessa, what, what do we do here to observe? Oh, yeah, you need a remote for sure. So here uh, in this image is just from our website. This is our uh, rotunda where you can actually see a live image of the sun. Um, and it's, I like to tell people that you're actually kind of standing inside of a telescope as soon as you enter this rotunda. Mm -hmm. Because the light that you see, uh, the light that, that, you're, that is gathered that you actually end up seeing an image from is traveling through the same room that you are standing in. So on either side there, on those two sides, there is a beam of light shining down onto the exhibit. So it's pretty pretty cool. So this is our triple beam coelostat. And here you can't tell that it's a triple beam coelostat, but here you can. Uh, so this is a lot different than um, many other telescopes that you're probably familiar with. Uh, so all the telescopes that you're familiar with are likely the ones that um, you have to point the objective to the object that you want to look at. So if you see the moon, you have to point the telescope to the moon. Um, and in this case, the coelostat doesn't do that. The telescope is actually at the center, um, and you move the mirrors to take the light and put it where it belongs. Uh, so the, you have two sets of mirrors here. You have the ones at the bottom, and then you have the ones at the top. Uh, so secondary are the ones at the top, and primary are the ones at the bottom. Um, and there's three of them. So this is the other thing that makes it different. So a lot of other coelostats uh, have one mirror for uh, the, or one beam of light that they're kind of dealing with. This one has three. So we have three different images that we can give you of the sun. Uh, so. This was all designed by uh, Russell Porter, which is pretty cool. Um, he has a lot of designs that are around the observatory. Uh, you definitely check it out when you get a chance. Um, so the sun will hit the center uh, beam right there, as you can see. Uh, kind of goes through the center. And then 
reflects up to the top telescope and then down through the center hole right there. Um, and at the center of the hole, there is a telescope. So there is a big lens uh, you can you see here. Uh, the lens focuses the light, brings it, uh, uh, that is the telescope, that is what you would consider the objective lens of a telescope. Uh, it goes through and it uh, hits a projection le uh, lens, another lens, but imagine it as like an eyepiece for a telescope. So the big one is the big lens at the end of the telescope and the projection lens is like the eyepiece. Uh, so that light hits the projection lens, it's focused and it hits a, a mirror and the mirror gives you this image here, uh, here at the center of the rotunda. So uh, the big bright image, if you're here during the day in the middle of the hall of the eye, or hall of the sky, sorry, um, <laughs> is a live image coming from the sun. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is one of the ways that we look at the sun. It is a, uh, a white light image, what we call it. Uh, what you're looking at here is the photosphere of the sun. So it's the bright part, the part that we're used to seeing. Uh, so the thing about this, the reason why we're able to see it like this is uh, because of something called the f-stop. So the, uh, the, the mirror at the top that's collecting the light, the objective, is uh, a lot smaller than the focal length. So the focal length is like the height of the building. So it's a really, really long ways before it actually focuses the light, uh, which actually makes it, it stops it down, if you've ever heard that term before. Uh, Stay with me if you're not uh, photographers or optics people. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it stops the light down so you get uh, a safe to look at image. So this is live from the sun. Love, one of my favorite things to look at. Um, yeah, and it is 21 inches across and the sunspots that you're seeing, you can actually walk up to it and like point at them. Um, and a lot of the museum guides will have this little piece of uh, laminated, uh, uh, it's like a little laminated piece of, of uh, circle that you can see is actually the size of the sun and they hold it up to it and you can compare the size of the sunspots to the size of the earth, sorry. Uh, yeah. So this is another image, a bigger sunspot there, uh, on there, which I really like. And this is what it looks like during an eclipse. This is in the past, uh, the last partial oh, eclipse uh, right. that we had last month. And it was amazing to look at. I thought it was beautiful through the celestat. I loved it. Mm -hmm. All right. And now, yeah, seeing the transit of Venus oh, yeah. on that was incredible. Yeah. Back, back 2016, was that, I think? Um, 14, 2014. Yeah, okay. yeah pretty early. <laughs> All right. So... The second part of our stat is the spectroscope. Uh, so this one is, um, it's not going to give you a full image of the sun the way the other one will. It'll give you a piece of the sun and you'll get to look deep into it. Uh, so what it does is it creates a rainbow. Uh, it separates the light of the sun and the photosphere into parts. Um, so this is what it is. It's this, the mirror at the top does this. So it goes down and instead of going through the hole in the middle, it goes to the top one. Uh, there's actually a lens in there. Uh, that brings it down to the observatory, and if you stand at the exhibit, you might see this. Uh, so the image of the sun is nice on this little uh, uh, copper plate, and we only lit in a tiny sliver of light. So right there at the center, uh, the plates will actually separate, and you'll get a very tiny piece of light going through the center. Um, and that light will go down into a pit, there's a pit there. <laughs> it goes about 12, 13 feet down. Um, and at the bottom, there is a grating that separates the light into a rainbow. Um, and the reason that the rainbow is interesting uh, is it actually tells you what the sun is made of. So uh, a little bit indirectly. So if we were to eliminate sort of the upper part of the photosphere of the sun uh, and the rest of it, then you would just see this really bright, uh, continuous spectra. Uh, but because there's stuff there absorbing some of the light, some of those elements, uh, you actually end up with something like this. Uh, so it doesn't, it's not the full spectrum. You can actually see those little lines there. They correlate with uh, different elements. So we can see what parts of the sun are made of. And this image is actually from our celestat, uh, from the, the, the uh, spectroscope. And that line right there, that big gap, is the uh, hydrogen alpha line. Yeah. Uh, yeah so. Mm -hmm. That actually brings me to the <laughs> last view. Uh, so again, triple beam seal set, three. Um, so this is the what used to be the spectroheliosope, and we still call it the spectroheliosope. Uh, so on this side, we are only looking at the hydrogen on the sun. So basically, we have that you know long f-stop, and also we have a bunch of filters that are taking out every single wavelength of light except for the one that correlates with hydrogen. And that's pretty amazing. So 
Um, the filters on there, one of them is called a, uh, an etalon, and it actually uses reflections and interference, so it, it interferes with each other, so you only get, you can tune it very exactly to get one wavelength of light that you want to look at. And it does it as precisely as it can. Sometimes it's a little bit wider, you don't get the, you know, as narrow of a band as you want. Uh, but it works, and you can actually see a lot of detail on it. So this piece right here, when you go into the observatory, this piece, um, is the telescope. So the light is hitting the top part, and you'll see it light up the, the, the telescope. And the light goes down into that little box, and then underneath it, there is an, another mirror. Um, and it comes back up, and you can look through it right there in that eyepiece where the red arrow is coming out. Uh, so you can see a live image of the sun that will look something like this, if you have really good eyes. Um, so. <laughs> This, uh, this is an image I actually took, uh, I think it was October 19th. Uh, so this is through our, our, our exhibit. Uh, and you can actually see some prominences there. It's pretty detailed. And this is the chromosphere of the sun. Uh, so it's sort of the upper, it's above the, the photosphere. And this is where you see a lot of that activity that, that uh, Dr. Reitzel was mentioning, the prominences, the, uh, the, the, you can actually see some of the sunspots, the flares, and um, some filaments and all that. So mm -hmm. you thought you were just getting a tour of the coelostat, but you also got a tour of the sun a little bit. Yeah. So, <laughs> different yeah. layers of the sun. So uh, the... Uh, photosphere right there is what you see with the white light image. The chromosphere is with the uh, hydrogen alpha, and kind of the combination of the two with the absorption in between them is the uh, spectroscope. So, yeah. Yeah. so <laughs> yeah. Griffith Observatory, we are an observatory. People come here and observe both day and night. We, we you know, come on down, or on up if you're down in Los Angeles, <laughs> as the case may be, and check it out. You can, you can see these things. now. Back to the solar cycle, we were using this instrument to notice there were lots of sunspots showing up. Well, mm -hmm. we thought, well, let's go back and look at the record. Um, the last solar cycle we had that peaked in, oh, about 2014 or so, um, it wasn't so big. We weren't getting a lot of sunspots at, at a given time. Um, so folks had made some predictions about what the next one would be like. Um, well, I went and dug around for some papers <laughs> and tried to find some predictions. Well, I found this one. Um, the sunspot cycles are connected to the Earth and Jupiter. Well, yeah, it turns out that there is a bit of a dynamo effect between the planets going around that can affect the sun, yeah. perhaps. Hmm. They're trying to figure out what's causing these sunspot cycles to happen. Well, as I dug a little bit deeper still, then I found this article. Why every observatory needs yeah. a disco ball? Um, yeah. I might have gotten a little off track. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it felt worth it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Let's contact the foundation and ask yeah. them for a disco ball. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, can we change the Foucault pendulum? Just make Ooh, it a disco that, ball. I think we've got the setup already. Well, disco I, comes back every eleven years. Yeah. yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> that could be pretty good. Bite your tongue. That could be some good fun. Um, anyway, it, this it, it really reminded me that gosh, it was years ago now, yeah. that Sarah, you had talked about what the next solar cycle would be. Do you remember what the prediction you reported on was? You didn't make the prediction, so we didn't hold you to it. <laughs> but what was that all about? Here, oh, how, how okay, I have the power. Sure. Yes, I do. All right, so we, every once in a while, we do get to, our guides here, we do get to go to the uh, Astronomical Society's convention. And I reported on one of the pieces. Uh, it was called Detection of Dynamo Waves Inside the Sun. Now, this report said that they had studied the using size, uh, helioseismology. I'm just going to let me speak for this. Yeah. <laughs> Let's oh, see, will it we play? need to hit play. Come on. Come you on. can do it. It can do it. I think there's another copy in there of it if we need it. No! Oh my gosh. This is a live All right, program, well, go ahead and riff and for a yeah. minute. <laughs> I'm going to blacken that out. And, um, I can. You want me one. to? Aha! All right, so if you watch <laughs> right here, you'll see this churning underneath, and then eventually it'll push okay, this right down here, and this is the sunspot activity. So you get cycle 24 happening over here while 23 is happening here. And it, so you're saying the vibrations on the surface can tell us what the magnetic yep. field is doing underneath, and that can tell us what the next cycle will do. Yes. So instead of this, which gives us lovely desktop images, we can look forward to this. So, which is actually really great for humans on the I've surface of more. the Earth, despite you know being protected by our, by our magnetic field ourselves, uh, because we have satellites. 
and we have astronauts, and we have power grids. Yeah. And so a calm sun like this means we're not getting blasted and irradiated by stuff that can damage our tech. Which is a good thing. Yeah. We will have sun, sun, <laughs> sunspots. Yeah, it won't be blank the entire time, but it won't be like sometimes we have tons and tons of them. So very yeah. interesting. We'll see if this holds true. All right. So if you watch right okay, here, now so it's you'll see we'll this churning. So we'll see if this holds true. Um, yeah, so is yeah, it yeah. holding true, Sarah? Yeah, not so much. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The prediction for a, so, a solar cycle 25 was that it would be roundabout like the last one. 24 <laughs> was fairly minimal. Now this uh, this <laughs> prediction was. As you can see, the word consensus up there. NASA yeah. and NOAA, yes, they put out a call for everybody who could predict what this next solar cycle would be like, because we've got so much tech up in space. Being able to predict what kind of damage they might incur, it's pretty important. So best minds were put to, put to it. They came up with this consensus prediction. Right. There was, however. Well, oh, OK. No, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, there was another prediction that said, oh no, 25 is going to be pretty high. Now, when was that made? Same time, oh. using a different method. Okay. Yes. So science doesn't always predict the... I the, know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what we've done there. Yeah, sorry about that. I, was like, I, I found this while I was doing the research. Like, did, what, were there retractions on this uh, missed prediction? What was said about it? And it turns well, out... But we were reporting on what was in the meeting, Absolutely. keep in mind. So yes. that was the, what you saw in the meeting, the paper that was reported <laughs> yeah. on. And it was even a press conference, if I remember right. It was, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it was that prediction because it was the consensus. That was the one that was put forward. This is what we expect for Solar Cycle 25. However, this team, Macintosh et al., what a strange last name. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> um, they predicted using a different method. The one that we saw was using helioseismology, which is seismic waves, sound waves vibrating inside the sun and using a, an extrapolation process to figure out what's mm -hmm. happening down in, deeper in the atmosphere. This team, they used sunspot numbers and they ran it through a, an algorithm and they found that there are things they called them termination events, and they're marked with these blue lines starting about 20, sorry, 19, 1850 or so. Yeah, I don't think we have time to go in and oh, show yeah, what these yeah. are actually doing. <laughs> no. But nonetheless, the upshot was the upshot that their was, method predicted more. Yes. Okay. Yeah, basically, you can see it on here. The closer those blue lines are, the bigger the next cycle. So the shorter the cycle you're on, the bigger the next cycle will be. Okay. Yeah, so and they got it pretty right. They got it, well, we, so far so, so good, far, we'll so see. Good. Now, Laura May, you were at a conference, and who did you run into there? Uh, so, are you, hold on, which conference are you talking well, about? Well, you ran into someone somewhere where they were talking about the solar cycle. And, uh, yeah. So certainly, uh, there were some papers that were mentioning the changes on the predictions of number of sunspots, just like you said, yeah. where it was predicted to be a very slow cycle mm -hmm. and that it ended up. So they changed the estimate originally for a maximum at about 115 sunspots to upwards of 150, closer to, in fact, 190. And yeah. Scott McIntosh was, in fact, one of the exactly. dissenting voices yes. uh, gotcha. who indeed pointed <laughs> out because of these termination events. And now it does seem that it's actually kind of splitting the difference. Yeah. And, it, exactly. and it's not only more, they seem to be coming earlier, and the peak might be early, yeah. too. We could be in for a peak, well, they were saying maybe later this year, but I don't think it's going to be this year. It looks like it's going to be early next year, mm -hmm. which is still early. So we'll, Yeah, we'll Noah, in fact, just released something new saying that it would be, they're now putting it as 2024, yeah. uh, which is a pretty oh. big change. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, so... We are, uh, you know, we're waiting and seeing. We're going to find out what's happening with it. But, um, yeah. Chris, yeah, <laughs> you know, this isn't always, uh, doesn't go so smoothly. Uh, Sarah alluded to it. But yeah, this is not an what? idle discussion. This actually is important. Uh, oh, would you like so, one of these? Yeah, please. <laughs> hey. um, no, uh, this actually does affect uh, mm. our lives in different ways. We're, we're protected here on the surface of the earth. I want to make it clear. We're, we're not talking about imminent danger for all of us, but we Unless do. Unless you're a you know, well, telegraph operator. You, well, okay. <laughs> Somebody always brings up the Carrington event. All right. Oh, thank you. Very rare situation. <laughs> 
But you no, know, it, it, there have been some situations with space tech where it really has had a substantial effect. Now, for those who do not know what uh, is on the slide here, who are not uh, an old graybeard like me, that is a space station. That is America's very first space station, uh, launched in 1973 called Skylab. And it is not tiny. We did not start small with space stations <laughs> because we still had the Saturn V. And that baby could throw a heavy load up. That's a 77-ton space station that has, a, you know, it's like 25-odd feet across. It's huge. And we put it up there in 1973. The sun was actually fairly quiet at the time. But in the end, the sun was going to destroy this station. We lost it because of the sun. That may seem strange. Actually, it's kind of funny because we, one of the things we did, the research we did in this station, it, the top part of it actually had an observatory. For those astronomers in the audience, here is the Apollo telescope mount crammed with eight instruments. <laughs> Two X-ray instruments, far ultraviolet, mid-ultraviolet bands, visual, and by the way, H-alpha, just so you know. <laughs> However, get the line to go see it in orbit is very long, so it's more convenient to visit Griffith Observatory. Well, they spent a lot of time studying the sun. They did all kinds of amazing work with Skylab. It's one of the things we did up there. Here is a picture of an observatory in space. This is shot in orbit with an astronomer, Ed Gibson, at work and Are you sure and that's floating. not Spock's station? Well, yeah. <laughs> right, the little thing he leads yeah. into, uh, somebody makes noise. <laughs> Fascinating. I mean, sure, that, that would happen. Actually, this room is Spock's station. Yeah, that's know true. our history. Um, but here, here he is uh, doing some uh, observations, and here's a picture to show you. Uh, this is actually, uh, in the light of the ionized helium, this is a picture of the sun. So kind of, kind of amazing there, the kinds of things they were able to do with observing the sun. They even, by the way, stepped out on the porch and drew pictures of what the sun looked like. Actually drew pictures of what it looked like without the Earth's atmosphere in the way. So what is going on with uh, the station running into trouble? Well, we went into a period of higher solar activity pretty quickly with Skylab. Um, they knew, the people at NASA, a basic truth, which is these solar storms will excite the Earth's atmosphere. And when they do that, the upper atmosphere actually swells up a bit. It gets higher in altitude. There is a tiny amount of air, even in this case, 270 miles up where uh, Skylab was, there's a little bit of atmosphere. And that produces a little bit of drag that will lower the orbit over time. But if with the sun being active, that rate of decay of the orbit increased, NASA knew that they initially calculated that the station had until about 1983 when they would need to go up and boost it. Now, that was okay. They had a new space program called the Space Shuttle they were going to build, <laughs> and it was going to be ready in 1979 to fly for the very first time. Definitely and they would go like up and that. attach a rocket motor <laughs> to Skylab and boost it. That's the artwork you're seeing there. NASA started developing it, but two things happened. Number one, the Space Shuttle was late really late, it was taking more time, and they realized it probably wouldn't fly till 1981. And then these changing forecasts, we're talking about that here, with the sun, it was more active than they expected. And 1983 became 1982, became 1981, became 1980, became 1979, when the station would re-enter. We weren't going to be able to go rescue it, and so in July of 1979, Skylab, our very first space station, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, burned up, parts of it fell on uh, Australia, and uh, we got a $400 park, uh, a littering ticket, actually from yeah. the Aussies. There's a, no one hurt, so it was okay. But you don't want this kind of thing to be happening all the time. But it did happen again. The sun keeps doing this to <laughs> us all the time. We weren't alone putting up space stations. We have the Soviets in those days, the Salyut space stations. And here's a picture of Salyut 7. Um, Salyut 7, a little bit smaller station, but still a very big station uh, that could house a crew of two for quite a while. Um, Salyut also was launched in a time where the, it was pretty quiet with the sun. Uh, but this was the next solar cycle. Salyut stayed around for many years. <laughs> 
And just like that, the sun just came out. And so I, this, this is the end of the sermon where I, I make my point to you all. And what happens is the sun started acting up more and more and more. And lo and behold, Salyut got into trouble. And Salyut ended up re-entering on the next solar cycle. The thing that was the same between both of these re-entries was that the sun surprised us. And especially in the case of Salyut, the re-entry was completely uncontrolled. Who knows where she's going to land? Roll of the mm -hmm. dice. And that's dangerous with this. So the sun is a big deal for the people living in different yeah. parts of the world for this. <laughs> South America, in this case, yeah. again, no one hurt, which is great. Um, this is a picture of the Mir space station that followed after Salyut for the uh, Soviets and then the Russians. Here it is re-entering and burning up in the Earth's atmosphere, but we learn our lessons. They knew the sun was going to excite the atmosphere again, and in this case, they used rocket motors to specifically deorbit the station safely. safely yeah. So well, the sun didn't cause a problem for all of us. No. Well, <clears throat> but it is still causing problems. There no, was a recent the one. SpaceX. Yep, SpaceX with Starlink. <laughs> Even mighty SpaceX. They launched a bunch of those communication satellites. The sun acted up. These were in low Earth ah, orbit. Yeah. Strike that order. Strike the sun that. acted up, and they launched anyway. Well, the, okay, now this is true. <laughs> e so a little bit of hubris e involved, e perhaps. E Elon, yeah, there's some things he can do. He probably made some phone calls to mm -hmm. the sun. Yeah. And said, "Look, like I got those. Those yeah. things have got to go up." Well, and he well, was it, he was playing the balance game. He's also into solar power, so he was like, "Solar power <laughs> satellites. <laughs> which is it going to be?" That's true. Um, and, well, and actually, there, there wasn't a serious danger in this case. These are small satellites. They knew they would burn up completely yeah. if there was a problem. In this case, the sat the satellites, and this is a safety feature, by the way. They're designed to be put into a very low orbit. They won't last long. They will naturally re-enter pretty quickly. Yeah. If there's a problem with it, it just comes back in. <laughs> they started to climb up on their rocket motors, and the sun raised the atmosphere a little bit, and they went ahead and came on in. Oh, so yeah. I hope you learned a lesson. So it's just an early, yeah. unplanned deorbiting. Yeah, yes, a rapid, early, unscheduled early. disassembly. Well, <laughs> we do need to move on to our next guest, who, by the way, um, has a connection to this solar H alpha imaging thing and I'm afraid we did not get an image of you uh, well, in your costume. It'll have to be maybe for next time. We'll have to exactly. leave it we'll as have a... to have you back. <laughs> but um, there is a connection that we can make next time for it. So but all the same, it is time to turn to um, Laura May who you went to Iceland. Uh, she's <sighs> she's one of our wonderful museum guides here, incredibly talented. And out of the blue I get an email from her that says I hope it's not a problem, but I need to leave the country for a little while. Now, that's a bit, pretty big surprise for most museum guides. Well, she's French, though. So I thought, well, she's going back to France, and then she says, I'm going to Iceland. The volcano's erupting, and I need to go. And I said, that sounds like science. By all means, of course. So, yeah. Yes. You know, lava's a good excuse, right, to skip work. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> although it, going back to France would have been okay, too. We might have asked you to bring back some... Um, anyway, dare I say chocolate croissants? Uh, to yes. Trigger, uh, to anyway. In fact, I apologize to my parents because I didn't go see them this summer so that I could go do this instead and frolic, frolic in lava. Anyway. Uh, so, but what, why were you there? And uh, do, you, you have a remote, I think. So just yes. take it away. Let, let us hear Absolutely. what we're doing tonight. So hello, everyone. My name is Laura May. Uh, I'm also a tornado chaser, by the way, and I guess at this point a volcano chaser. Uh, this is a segment we're going to do on volcanology. You might notice I'm... Uh, I'm wearing a little Boy. nod to volcanology. We are, in fact, in the Leonard Nimoy event I horizon. See the point. You see the yes. <laughs> it's gonna be this guy. Oh, okay. nicely done. I think finally, this is the finally. I got one in. <laughs> so yes. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what's been happening in Iceland these past years. It's been both exciting and, if you've been watching the news, also a little bit stressful these days. Um, so this is an image I shot from a helicopter of the 2022 eruption, which I will go back to. Uh, there are many connections, by the way, between volcanoes and astronomy. In case you're wondering, we do have a lot of volcanoes in space. Uh, so here is an image of a volcano on Venus called Gula Mons, and the most famous volcanic body in our in our solar system on the other side, which is Io, Jupiter's beautiful moon. There are, in fact, two plumes on this image. So there's the one you're seeing on the limb here, uh, and there's another one kind of near the Terminator uh, that you can see the shadow of. Uh, we also have a lot of cryovolcanism in the solar system, including comets. So yeah, lots of volcanism happening. Uh, now here's another interesting connection between astronomy and volcanism. So this is research from Cambridge University, 
And Cambridge University looked through a lot of il illuminated manuscripts and they were looking specifically at a lot of mentions of eclipses. And they happened to realize that many of these mentions mentioned a dimming of these eclipses and tried to figure out what was causing this, right? And this, is, this actually allowed us to pinpoint some dates for volcanic eruptions. Uh, so here is an example of effects on our atmosphere. So on the left, we have an image of a lunar eclipse from 1992, which was affected by an eruption from Mount Pinatubo. I think I believe that's in the Philippines. Uh, and then on the right, we've got what many of you may have observed before. We've got a lunar eclipse, often called a blood moon eclipse. Now on the right is a different image and you might have lived in Los Angeles at the time. So this is a purple sunset, and believe it or not, this is also caused by an eruption. I shot this right down the street uh, in Los Feliz, and this was caused by an eruption of right coke volcano. Uh, so we do get a lot of aerosols and sulfur into the stratosphere for the very big explosive eruptions, right? That can, example, color our skies. Uh, so something that is asked very often is can the moon affect a Eruptions. Now, if anyone uh, knows anything about this website, Spurious Connections, uh, Spurious Correlations. <laughs> That's kind of a giveaway. Right? Uh, in fact, we do a show in here often <laughs> called The Comet Show, Clues from Comets, where we talk about connection or coincidence, right? And so I put this graph to give you a short answer. No. <laughs> Sadly. Uh, the effects, the tidal effects from the moon are actually magnitudes lower and smaller than our geophysical effects from the Earth and all of the movements of these tectonic plates. So the last connection, or one of many more, but is the aurora borealis, right? So anyone who chases auroras, uh, I chased for many, many years. Uh, Iceland is a great place to do so, and especially during solar maxima. We were just talking about the solar cycle. So these next, this next year or so will be a great time to do so. So this is another image that I shot in Iceland where I was chasing the auroras. Now, most people remember the eruptions in Iceland from 2010, the Eyjafjallajökull eruption. Uh, in case you wanted the spelling this is, or, or the pronunciation, a friend of mine was wearing this wonderful shirt because Icelandic is not an easy language. Uh, so the Eyjafjallajökull was mostly famous because it disrupted a lot of the air traffic across Europe. I was living in London at the time, and I did have a flight canceled, many, many flight cancellations. Uh, this was a stratovolcano, and it erupted. It had this very explosive eruption, uh, what are often called the gray volcanoes, and lots of ash, ash plume in the atmosphere, in the air, that very bad for airplanes, apparently. So to give you a little bit of context uh, before we dive into these latest eruptions, I want to just show you on the map. So this is a relief map. Uh, of our Earth that shows very clearly, you'll notice this very long line, this kind of zigzag that is cutting in between on the Atlantic Ocean. And so Iceland is located right atop there, right next to Greenland, to the east of Greenland. And it is located on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is a divergent plate boundary, right? And so it sits astride this Eurasian and North American plate. It is, in fact, what is called a hot spot, right? And so that's why it was created. It came out of this hot spot. And so here, I also want to show you on that top left little image, uh, we've got a series of little, little boundaries here. Uh, and so it's not just a simple line, right? These are more zones where we've got all sorts of fissures and things interacting. So it's not a straight line cutting through Iceland. And this main image is showing us a part of Iceland that sits on the south west of the island, where you'll notice in orange these different bands that are different volcanic systems. It's called an echelon. And so we've got these different systems. And right in the middle here, you'll notice a system called Fagradalsfjall, another, another fun one to pronounce. Uh, I'm just going to, this is just for kind of people who want to look at this more deeply. Uh, these are the data points on past eruptions. Now, what's important to note is that we don't really see necessarily a cyclicity, a cycle to this, right? So volcanic eruptions are very, very difficult to predict. And in this case, we've only got these three data points, very difficult to say, oh, what well, happens every X number of years? And you'll notice right in the middle, Fagradalsfjall, which has not erupted in about 6,000 years, depending again on if you consider the whole system or just that one. 
And so it surprised everyone when uh, there started to be a lot of tremors in 2019 and 2020 that headed into an eruption in 2020. Started right around the pandemic. Many of us were watching it on YouTube. It was a pretty, pretty interesting eruption. And, you know, one of the fortunate things, it happened right in the middle of nowhere. Uh, middle of nowhere in a valley called Gelding Adalir. So on this image, this is an image I shot of kind of the end of that lava descent into the valley. Uh, the volcano is actually quite far on this image, on the, on the left top of the image. And this was just the very end. Uh, and this is an image of the crater that I also shot from a helicopter. It's always very hard to tell the scale of these things. It can look quite small, but they are actually quite massive. I didn't put a banana for scale in there, unfortunately, <laughs> or giraffe or whatever we're using nowadays with asteroids. So this is another image that I shot just about uh, three days into the second eruption that happened in Mera Dalir. Uh, so again, an image of this little central crater, and it was, it was just a baby when I shot this. And the point I want to make also when I show you these images is to show you the difference between Fagradal's Fiat and Eya Fiat Layoko, right? These are uh, the red, kind of gentle volcanoes. They have these effusive lava flows, uh, very fluid. And then this is the third chapter from this year when, again, fortunately, I was grateful that Dr. Reitzel allowed me to leave for lava. <laughs> you left work to go <laughs> I left there? work to go do this. <laughs> and I was like, sorry, guys. A volcano just erupted. I have to leave again. Uh, and so this was an eruption. So all these eruptions, by the way, happened kind of in the same area. Unfortunately, they kept happening further and further away from the road. So that was great. Uh, it was a lot of walking and hiking, et cetera, to get there. So this is the last one from July, Litli Hrutur, uh, which is the mountain right next to it where it occurred. And I wanted to show you a very special event that happened whilst I was there. So let's see if this will actually play. Uh, so I'll show you a few seconds of this. I have to cut the sound because I don't think you guys want to hear me scream for two minutes. But just as I was setting up for my project there, uh, we had this wonderful heat vortex that appeared. Uh, so these do appear fairly frequently at volcanic eruptions. They're caused by the immense enormous amount of heat and so this is what I call a volcano NATO uh, so I felt very fortunate to get to see this uh, again you can see a longer a longer portion of this there are other little vortices that interact with it but it is actually moving and there's actually people kind of right next to it they're a little closer to dust devils than tornadoes uh, but absolutely incredible to see let me see if it will pass this. So this was the project that I had cooked up in 2022 that I wanted to do mainly in 2023. Uh, I'm also an artist. I mostly paint things related to astrophysics. And so I wanted to go and paint an active eruption in situ. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever done this before. I couldn't find any records of it. Uh, I have a detailed account of this. It was very, very challenging to do, as easy as it looks. It looks like I'm, I'm nicely set up there, but this was a very, very difficult thing to do. I was carrying massive amounts of paints and canvases and things uh, in order to do this. And part of what I wanted to do as well was to sample active lava onto the canvas. I know, I know. Sorry, mom, if you're watching this. <laughs> Explain uh, <laughs> that to HR. I know, I, mean, I know, right? security. Uh, and I do want to say, before I show you videos also of some of this, so this was particularly complicated to do, but I do want to say I was trained by a planetary scientist on how to do this, and I'm also a fire stunt person. I'm trained in fire breathing from the London Fire School, uh, so I can behave myself around fire and lava, and I would highly recommend you never, ever attempt to do this for any of our viewers. Uh, so I want to just quickly show kind of uh, the inspirations for also why I wanted to do the lava sampling. So on the left is a painting by Miro uh, called Toile Brûlée, and on the Spanish painter and on the right is the Codex Regis. This is one of the important, most important texts of Norse mythology. You'll notice that little hole in it. Uh, it's from the 1200s and it mentions a volcanic eruption. So again, another event that helps us sometimes, another document to help us trace back eruptions. So this is just some close-ups of some of the effects on the painting. Uh, and here's a video, and I use this video because I want to show you also the different types of lava. Uh, so right here, this is from 2021. Uh, so this is me sampling some very nice pahoe hoey lava. Uh, so this is a very gentle, this is very pillowy lava. Don't be mistaken, it is absolutely scorching. It is like standing in front of an enormous oven when you do this, right? It is. It always takes multiple attempts. Uh, and yeah, again, you should not be attempting to do this. 
And here I want to show you, oh, actually, can you, can you, oh, there we go. It went straight to the other one. So this is from 2021. And hopefully you can see that the texture is quite different. Uh, so this was ah, ah lava, as it's called. And so this is much sharper. It's got much sharper edges. It doesn't progress. It doesn't move in quite the same way. Uh, and it was actually very difficult to sample this one. Now, what I'm doing in those videos also is quenching lava. Uh, and this was partly to send to some geologist friends, partly for educational purposes. I have some of it with me. Uh, yeah. And so all right, I don't think we need the, the commentary on this. But the quenching of lava is very important because it provides a snapshot of that specific moment, that specific lava, what its composition is, what its gas content is. And so in fact, through the 2021 eruption, there was a lot of different sampling that showed a lot of different lava types taken from lots of, it tells us a little bit of where it's coming from and the reservoir and the magma chamber, so very important. Uh, this is an image from of, two, of the two eruptions. So this is the 2021, which had stopped. Uh, and in the back, you'll see the 2022, again, shot from the air. Uh, and that is not a color-enhanced image, by the way. These are the actual colors a year after that crater stopped erupting. Uh, you'll notice kind of these traces of iron, and there's a lot of sulfur, uh, lots of geological processes happening. And in the back, you'll see that kind of darker, bluer lava. So this is just to show you also different forms of lava. I do have some with me that I can show you at the end of this. Uh, so we've got this uh, on the left, I believe it is tephra. Uh, it's very light. It's kind of like this little ash, this little bundle of ash. Uh, in the middle, it's to show you some of the crystals that you can generally find. You can find feldspar, you can find pyroxene, you can find olivine crystals, a little similar to meteorites. And again, on the right is a piece uh, of that first eruption. Again, this is just, you know, I, I took it right there. This is a piece that's a week old and you can see all those incredible colors on it all of the geological processes. So if you've watched the news, you might have heard people say, oh my goodness, there is a volcano that's about to erupt under the Blue Lagoon. This is an incredible image from my favorite part of Iceland. It's a region called Photoshop. Uh, this, is, this is not exactly what is happening right now. Uh, so there is a lot happening right now in Grindavik. So in late October, we started getting a massive amount of tremors and earthquakes there. Uh, and it is not the same system that had awoken in the previous, this is not the Fagradals Fiat system, right? Uh, so on this image, this is to show you all of the earthquakes that occurred along this line. So we have a pretty good idea of where the magma is and kind of where it's moving. And unfortunately, that happens to be right next to a town called Grindavik. Grindavik is a wonderful town. I've stayed there many times. And so the image on the left is actually showing us a difference in height. Uh, believe it or not, parts of it have sunk. Uh, so this is what's called, uh, also that little image is from a golf course. Uh, you'll notice we have a helpful benchmark. New, new holes opening new, new up holes all the time. Opening up. And, it, and it's a fantastic golf course because it advertises itself as being on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, etc. So now it's, it's really right there in it. Uh, but, you know, jokes aside, the damage to Grindavik is considerable. Uh, we are still waiting to know what might happen. Uh, so if it doesn't happen in the next 10 days, it's pretty much certain that it's not going to happen this round. But it could happen again in a month. No one really knows. Everything's up in the air right now. We don't really know. Personally, my money is on it not happening right now because I've looked at a lot of eruption data over the past years. Uh, and I certainly hope that for the people of Grindavik who have had to be evacuated and who are elsewhere right now. And this is just to give you uh, a couple of illustrations also and to just kind of bring you back to Griffith Observatory, uh, where we are, of course, a museum and an observatory, right? We have a lot of art, we have a lot of, and we have observation. Uh, as my colleagues told you, we observe with the silo stat. And this is really the point I want to make regarding observing things, right? Uh, when I go to volcanic eruptions, I'm trained in astrophysics, not necessarily volcanoes. That was not what I studied. But there is a lot of power to observing things, right? And this is what we want, us, we want the public to do when they come to Griffith Observatory, is to observe. And so I encourage you, when it comes to natural phenomena, to really conduct observations uh, and to really you know, see the power in that and how we use, for example, these examples of art. So this is Mount Fuji on the left, painted by Hakuzai. 
And this is a painting I found randomly in an exhibit in Paris uh, that features Mount Vesuvius. And so we use a lot of art to trace things back. And that is, again, the power of observing and something that anyone, even if you're not trained in the sciences, can do. So thank you very much. I just want to say a brief thank you to Girls Who Chase, uh, the tornado uh, ladies, tornado chasers that I'm part of, and my mentors, Quebec Vortex. Uh, and I have a lot more footage of all this volcano stuff on my links if you want to, to see more more lava. Yeah. There you go. Well, thank you, Laura May, for yeah. that. Everybody, let's thank, thank Laura May. Um, in an app after tonight's program, if folks in the audience, if you want to show off some yeah. of the lava samples, um, yeah. people can wait around and talk to her afterwards. Did, did, did you get um, the ring in? <laughs> you know, you watch people throw things all the time when you're on the border of the crater, and it's hilarious because oh. there are little lava rivers, yeah. and people try to throw little rocks, and they think it's going to sink exactly <laughs> like the one ring, and it doesn't. Uh, it just kind of, you know, lava is a non-Newtonian well. fluid, and it has these different consistencies, and so it just kind of sometimes will just boop sit on the lava and keep moving, and it's quite amusing when you've been there many times and you see that. Yeah, but the one ring would sink. Well, the one ring would. So, special but listen, tough I, situation. At the next uh, eruption, I'm hoping the observatory can fund the one the ring. One ring Maybe shops can make us a one they, ring. They might and be I able to. Well, it's better than making Gollum well, and throwing him in. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm more Frodo, but. Exactly. Well, folks, we need to move on to our, our next guest. Um, but thank you all for, uh, you know, or thank you our panel for joining us tonight. And thank you, Laura May, for, for being here. Um, but we now are going to welcome um, our, our main guest. So are you getting that set up over there, Sarah? Should I pass him the mic? Um, is our guest mic'd up? No, he's mic'd up. Okay. He has his own mic. So um, I think we may as well stand up for this because we're going to get rid of oh, some yeah. of our furniture <laughs> yep. as we get set here. So we can get rid of those. We'll push this back here. No, you won't see it up there yet, Sarah. No, I didn't. Is that? This is blank. All right, well, we'll take a look. We'll see if that works. Hopefully it will. All right, well, um, anyway, it's now time for our very special guest, um, Princeton professor, Dr. Joshua Wynn, who works on something called exoplanets. These are planets around other stars. In fact, he's one of the architects of the TESS mission, which is um, a satellite that is up there finding exoplanets right now. So everybody, let's welcome Joshua Wynn. Come on up. Thank you so much. Get rid of this. And we will change the lighting a little bit. And that one. Great. Thank you. So I think you might need to switch the oh, computer. Got to switch the computers yeah. again. Terrific. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. In fact, uh, I don't know you, with, with few exceptions we've never met before, but based only on the fact that you have decided to spend your free time on a Thursday evening coming in to learn about astronomy, I'm pretty sure we all have something in common, which is that at some point in your life, maybe recently, maybe when you were a child, you were outside on a clear, dark night, looking up at the sky, and you started wondering, do any of those stars have planets, planets like the Earth? Do any of those planets have creatures on them, looking up in their sky, maybe even looking back at the sun, looking at me, wondering the same thing? You may not have known the term at the time, but you were thinking about exoplanets. An exoplanet is a planet, but it's around a distant star, well outside the solar system. People have been pondering these questions for centuries, ever since we realized that those points of light in the sky are entire stars similar to the sun. But it's only been about 25 years that those philosophical speculations have turned into research programs. And this is now one of the hottest and most rapidly advancing fields of astronomy, exoplanetary science. One of the fun things about it is that long before the first exoplanets were discovered in the mid-1990s, science fiction had prepared us by fueling our imaginations. 
And the Star Wars movies are, are especially useful in this regard. For example, Mustafar, a planet sort of like Iceland all over, I guess, uh, where uh, Ben Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker had their climactic lightsaber duel on a planet covered with oceans of lava. Or Tatooine, Luke Skywalker's home, where he gazed yearningly toward the horizon and was able to watch two suns setting in the sky. The great news is that we know of real exoplanets that share the key characteristics that made these two science fiction worlds so interesting and so compelling. So part of my job tonight is to help you see the boundary between science and science fiction and also see how fast it's moving. So first though, uh, before we get carried away, let's remind ourselves about uh, the familiar planets, the planets of the solar system. There are eight of them, and here they are uh, on the same scale, so you can perceive their relative sizes. There are four little guys, the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, and the Earth. Then there are two sort of medium-sized planets, Uranus and Neptune, and two gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. If we look at a map of the solar system, we can see a couple of patterns, regularities, that uh, as soon as they were perceived by our ancestors came to, to achieve uh, great significance in their thinking about the solar system. First of all, if we look down on the solar system and look at all the orbits of the planets, we see that the orbits are nearly circular. Now, what's interesting about that is that there's no law of physics that says orbits have to be circular. What you learn in physics is that the general case is an ellipse. And that can range from a near circle to a very squashed oval shape. So the fact that the actual orbits are nearly circular seems significant, seems to be telling us something about the formation of the solar system. Now, so the orbits are nearly circular. If we look at the solar system from the side, we see another one of those patterns. The orbits are nearly aligned with each other. They all lie in nearly the same plane. And likewise, there's no law of physics that says that has to be the case. You can imagine planetary systems where the planet's orbits are, are misaligned by large angles. But the solar system isn't like that. And so that, too, seems to be telling us something about the origin of the solar system. And then, finally, there's another pattern, which is that the rocky planets, the little guys, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are all crammed on the inside, very close to the sun, all in this space here. And the larger planets, which are mostly made of gas, hydrogen, and helium, are the four that are on the outside. So that doesn't seem like a coincidence. It seems like there should be some reason why the little guys are close to the sun and the larger planets are on the outside. Now, you've probably noticed or already knew that Pluto does not obey any of these three patterns. It is a small planet, and it is on a non-circular orbit that is misaligned with respect to the other planets. But we're scientists. We know, we know what to do about that. We simply redefine the word planet so that Pluto no longer qualifies, and now there are no exceptions. So, of course, there, there are other very good reasons why Pluto was reclassified. It is a member of a different category of objects in the solar system called the Kuiper Belt objects, but that is a story for another day. So these are the three most striking patterns in the solar system, and they inspired our theories of planet formation. So how does that theory look? That's a theory that developed over many decades by many different uh, physicists and astronomers, and it's a rather complex story. The story is that both the sun and the planets formed, rather late in the universe actually, from the collapse of a cloud of material that was just floating around the galaxy. When we look around the galaxy today, we see a lot of these clouds. They're mostly hydrogen and helium, but they do have some solid material sprinkled in there, some grains of dust, some flecks of ice. And what can happen <clears throat> is that for reasons we're not quite clear on, every now and then there might be a trigger that causes the cloud 
to collapse under its own gravity. Gravity is a force that causes everything to attract everything else. So that will cause all of the material in this cloud to kind of converge on the center. So the, the cloud undergoes gravitational contraction. And you might think that that just causes everything to collapse to a single point. But it doesn't work that way. Because of the turbulent motion in the cloud and any initial sense of rotation of this cloud, that gets amplified. As the, as the cloud gets smaller and smaller again. And that causes, instead of collapsing to a single point, it collapses into a kind of a whirlpool that surrounds the material that does make it to the center for a very long time. So there's a prolonged phase of several million years when the, there's the sun, that's the material that actually makes it to the center, is surrounded by the spinning flat vortex of material. And that's called a protoplanetary disk because it is thought that is where the planets formed. They formed as the solid particles in that disk, the, the grains of dust, the flecks of ice, uh, collided with each other and stuck to form larger and larger bodies, eventually working their way all the way up to the sizes of planets. So that's the theory. And it is a beautiful theory because it explains those three patterns in the solar system. How does it explain them? Well. Why are the orbits circular? It's because this disk is circular, and the planets formed within this circular spinning disk. Why are the orbits aligned? That's easy. It's because they formed in this flat disk. Any planets that form in this planar structure are going to have aligned orbits. The third pattern is a little trickier. Why are the gas giants far from the sun, and the smaller terrestrial planets close to the sun? That's basically because of the temperature. Close to the sun, it's hotter. There's more heat from that central star. And that removes some of the material that would otherwise be solid. It causes things like water and ammonia and common molecules to vaporize rather than remaining solid. And so out far away from the sun, where it's cold, there was more solid material in the disk. And that is what allows planets to build up to much larger and more massive proportions. So as you can see, it's a great story. It fits all of the facts. It seems physically plausible. However, you need to be skeptical because the theory was invented to fit the facts. The facts were known before the theory was developed. And for a long time, the only facts were the facts of the solar system. So that was another reason to be excited about one day being able to detect exoplanets was to test this theory. In this theory, there's nothing special about the solar system. These events are kind of inevitable. Whenever you form a star, you should form planets, and they should have these three properties. So is that the case? When we look at exoplanetary systems, will we see them obeying these three patterns? Well, uh, the first part of the story, before planets were discovered, was that astronomers came to an understanding that these disks, at least, are real. They exist. They were hypo hypothetical for many years, but they do exist. I'm going to skip over a lot of history. It was initially a very indirect detection, but today we can just see them. We have a telescope called ALMA in northern Chile. It's a big international collaboration that built this instrument that can measure the radiation from the dust grains in these protoplanetary disks. So what I'm going to show you now is a real image of a star that was known to be young for other reasons, and it is surrounded by one of these protoplanetary disks. So the star is here. This is called HL Tauri. And you don't actually see the star. The star is not glowing especially brightly at these wavelengths. What you're actually seeing is the radiation from all of that dust. And we're viewing it from a 45 degree angle, so what is intrinsically a circular flat object looks like an oval just because of our viewing geometry. So this is one of these protoplanetary disks. It even seems to have some evacuated uh, rings in it, some dark lanes. It's not exactly clear why that is, but it might be related to planets that are forming right there today, causing these structures to form in the disk. By the way, on the right here, just for scale, is what the solar system would look like viewed from the same distance and, and from the same angle. So you can see this is roughly the same scale as our solar system. So this is great. 
and we have a lot of these images now, thanks to this new observatory. These little protoplanetary disks take on a wide range of sizes and shapes. Some of them look like uh, these little bullseye targets here. Others look like more like filled disks. You even have ones that look like little spiral structures, kind of like uh, entire galaxies. So that is another booming area of modern astrophysics, is the study of these protoplanetary disks. However, in none of these images can you actually see the planets. The planets, if, if they're there, are too small and too faint to be detected. There's so many more dust grains than planets that the emission that we see is dominated by the radiation from these dust grains. So that's frustrating. So how do you detect an exoplanet? What would you do if I asked you, please find an exoplanet? The first thing you would probably do is say, OK, I'm going to go out at night. I'm going to get a telescope, maybe a really big telescope. I am going to pick a star in the sky and use the telescope to zoom in as much as I can. So maybe this star here. Point the telescope at it, magnify as much as I can. Maybe I'll be able to see that star. And if I look really hard and if the telescope is really good, maybe I will also see these tiny little objects orbiting the star. Those would be the planets. This is the so-called direct imaging method. You make a picture of a nearby star and you look for little dots circling around it. That would be the planets. Unfortunately, when you get your telescope, when you perform this observation, you don't get this. Instead, the result is more like this. <laughs> All you're seeing is the glare from the star. This is a star that is so far away that with a completely idealized camera, all you would see is a single illuminated pixel at the center of the image, but you don't. That's because the basic laws of optics prevent us from focusing starlight as tightly as we might want to. There is always a limit. And so if you zoom way in on a picture of a star, all you see is that starlight, the glare from that star spilling over that part of the image, completely hiding the much fainter light from any planets that are going around it. So if you were 100 light years away, looking towards the sun, trying to spot the Earth, the Earth is 10 billion times fainter than the sun, and it's right next to it. So that is why this method, this so-called direct imaging method, is borderline impossible. It is often compared to trying to spot a firefly when someone is shining a searchlight directly in your eyes. And to order of magnitude, that's about right. So like I said, borderline impossible. Nevertheless, we do know of more than 5,000 exoplanets these days. Most of them do not come from direct imaging. We have sneakier methods, methods that get around this problem of the extremely high contrast between the planet and the star. We actually have five such methods that are more indirect. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you tonight about two of them, the two most important such methods that have given us most of the planets in this catalog of more than 5,000 and most of our information about planets. The first of these methods is based on the fact that we teach our children that the planets go around the sun. The planets orbit the sun. This is not quite right. Like, technically speaking, if you have a star and a planet, they are both orbiting. They are both moving around the center of mass of the planetary system. That is the location that is the mass-weighted average position of all of the atoms in the system. Um, one way to think about it is because of Newton's uh, third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, if the star is pulling on the planet with its gravity, the planet must be pulling on the star with the same force in the opposite direction. So that causes the star to move. The star is much more massive than the planet, so it doesn't move very much, but it does move. And that's what gives us our way in, because we've gotten very good at measuring the motion of stars very precisely. The trick we use is the Doppler shift. You've probably heard of the Doppler shift, but just in case, and just in case any of you have fallen asleep, this is the Doppler shift. Ready? <laughs> Ready? 
you get the Doppler shift whenever you have a source of waves that is moving relative to the observer. So in the case of the car, uh, you, you honk on the horn, it's emitting sound waves. And like any wave, sound waves have a certain wavelength. They are pressure waves. And the distance between the maxima of those pressure waves is called the wavelength. And if the car is sitting still, it just emanates these sound waves in all directions. But if the car is moving, now in the forward direction, the car is catching up to its own previously emitted waves. And so if you are viewing the car from this direction, the waves that reach you have a shorter wavelength than before. And for sound, shorter wavelength means higher pitch. And if you are behind the car, the opposite is true. The car is racing away from its previously emitted waves, so the observed wavelength is longer, which means lower pitch. Okay. Same thing happens for any type of wave, and light is a wave, or at least it has certain wave-like properties. And so if a star is moving, or any source of light, and you are viewing it as it's coming towards you, the wavelength of the light is shifted to a smaller value, which for, for light corresponds to a bluer color. And if you are here and the star is moving away from you, it is stretched to a longer wavelength, which means a redder color. It's shifted to the red end of the spectrum. So we see a red shift or a blue shift. Now, why do we never notice this in everyday life? Why is it if a car is coming at you at night with its headlights on, the lights don't look any bluer than they usually do. It's because the fractional change in the wavelength is the speed of the object, the car, the star, divided by the speed of light. And the speed of light is huge, and so these changes in wavelengths are very tiny. So we need rather precise equipment, far more precise than our eyes, to be able to perceive them. What really helps is spectroscopy which we heard about earlier in the context of the, uh, the solar observing that's done here at the Griffith Observatory. If you take the light from a star, like the sun, and you send it through a prism or a bounce it off of the right kind of a grating, you get this beautiful rainbow. But if you look closely, you see that it is interrupted by these dark lines, these kind of colors, the very specific colors that are missing from the rainbow. The reason that happens is, as we heard earlier, because of the substances in the outer atmosphere of the sun, um, have, each have their favorite wavelengths that they absorb much more than other wavelengths. For reasons related to the electronic structure of the atoms or ions or molecules. For example, sodium is very fond of this particular shade of yellow-orange. So if you see this dark line at this special wavelength, you can be pretty sure there is at least a little bit of sodium in the atmosphere of this glowing object. And we saw earlier there's a line for, for hot hydrogen, a line for magnesium. All of that is fascinating, and it is, in fact, how we learn the composition of astronomical bodies. But for the problem I'm describing, for measuring the Doppler shift, they're just convenient. They are nice, sharp, dark features that we can track very precisely and see if they're shifting around. Okay, so just schematically, what's happening here is the star and the planet are moving around the center of mass of the system, so the star is moving. And so if we look at the star's spectrum, we will see those dark lines moving back and forth as the star moves away from us and towards us. They're shifting in wavelength. We can make a chart showing the star's calculated speed as a function of time as it moves away from us, towards us, and away from us. And that betrays the existence of the planet. From this chart, we can calculate, uh, we, can, we can see how long it takes for the planet to go all the way around. That's how long it takes for this pattern to repeat. It's called the orbital period of the planet. And the maximum speed, the amplitude of this signal, is related to the mass of the planet. The more mass of the planet, the more it pulls the star around. So those are the two things that we can learn by tracking the star's Doppler shift. Okay. Now. One of the things I want to do tonight is to bring you right to the frontier. I want to show you real data and how we draw these inferences that I've been describing from the data. So I'm going to show you some real data for a really important Doppler-detected planet. Uh, this is the southern sky, just to show you uh, kind of the neighborhood that we're in. 
Maybe some of you have had the pleasure of traveling to the Southern Hemisphere. You can see all kinds of good stuff down there. This is the famous Southern Cross. The constellation of Centaurus kind of arcs around the, the Southern Cross. And this object here, does anybody happen to know what is that object? That is the Alpha Centauri system. That's right. So it's actually a pair of stars. And it is often said to be the nearest such stars to the sun, our nearest neighbors in the galaxy. There's a lot of sci-fi stories that are set on Alpha Centauri for that reason. The, uh, the planet on, in the movie Avatar, for example, is orbiting one of the stars of Alpha Centauri. However, it's actually not the closest pair of stars to the sun. There's actually a star that's even just a little bit closer. But you can't see it with the naked eye. You need at least a good pair of binoculars because it's a tiny little red star down here. It is called Proxima Centauri, and that is literally the closest star to the sun. It is our nearest neighbor. And so it was very exciting when, I think it was in 2016, a team announced that they had detected a planet orbiting Proxima Centauri with the Doppler method. And the planet was not that much more massive than the Earth. So it's a potentially terrestrial type planet, a solid planet rather than a gaseous planet. Even more exciting is that the planet is orbiting in the so-called habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. The habitable zone is the range of distances from the star where an Earth-like planet would be receiving the right amount of heat from the star to allow water to be a liquid, as opposed to a gas. If you're too close to the star, the water will boil, or a solid. If you're too far away, the water freezes. If you can have liquid water oceans, we say you are in the habitable zone. Now, why do we call that the habitable zone instead of the ocean zone or the swimming zone or something like that? It's because, at least on Earth, all known forms of life require liquid water at some phase of their existence. So we think that liquid water is very important for life on Earth. In fact, most scientists who've studied it seem to think that life got started in the oceans. And so if we're going to have to prioritize the planets that we find for how likely they are to have life and how much we should explore them, maybe we should prioritize the planets where you have oceans, where you can go for a swim, the planets in the, in the habitable zone. So this is very exciting. Our literal next-door neighbor in the galaxy has a potentially Earth-like planet in its habitable zone. That's why this was front-page news at the time. And if you were paying attention, if you saw these news articles, they were often accompanied by this amazing image from the planet's surface, right? <laughs> we have, you know, we can see Proxima. We can even see the two stars of Alpha Centauri over here. We can see these mountains. There's some kind of a valley here. There's even a mist rising from the valley. Of course, this is complete fantasy. We have no idea what it might look like from the surface of the planet. We are very far away, maybe centuries away, from being able to get this kind of detail for an exoplanet. Instead, everything we know about the planet is derived from this chart. Everything, every bit of information. What this chart is, it's speed, the thing that we measure with the Doppler method, as a function of time in days here. And these are two different seasons of observing this star. And the, the, the colored points are the data. So it's, you know, it's not the greatest data in the world, but you can see there's a tendency for the data points to go up and down and up and down and up and down. That is the evidence for the planet around Proxima Centauri. And it's the amplitude of this signal, the fact that it's a few meters per second that tells us a quantity related to the mass of the planet, and the, the period of this signal, the repetition period, tells us how long it takes to go around, which is related to the size of the orbit, and that's how we know the temperature of the planet. That's how we know it's in the habitable zone, because we can calculate the distance between the star and the planet from this chart. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind, is that when I think, when, when uh, most of you think of planets, you are thinking about a panorama. You're thinking about Mars, you're thinking about the clouds on Jupiter, that kind of thing. When I think of exoplanets, and when my colleagues do, we're thinking of things like this. We are thinking about charts and how we can use our knowledge of physics to go from these charts to reliable inferences about what these planets might actually be like. 
Okay, another Doppler planet. This one is uh, quite famous in the astronomy world. It's called 51 Pegasi. It's a sun-like star. And again, we see, in fact, much more clearly this time, we see the up-down uh, motion on this chart. That's because the star is circling around, and so it's alternately coming towards us and away from us and towards us and away from us, being pulled by an orbiting planet. The amplitude in this case is quite a bit larger. Before it was just a few meters per second. Now it looks like it's about 70 meters per second. That tells us we are dealing with a giant planet. This is a kind of Jupiter-like planet, much more than the Earth-like planet. What was weird, what was shocking, uh, one reason why this planet is so famous is the horizontal axis. Okay. It completes a revolution every four days or so. That's a teeny tiny little orbit. This is a giant planet that is nevertheless very close to the star that it orbits. Contradicting that story I told you 10 minutes ago about how giant planets should always be far from the star, where it was colder, where it was possible to gather up more solid material and make a larger planet. So this discovery, which was really one of the first discoveries of any kind of exoplanet, already contradicted that tenet of planet formation theory. That's another reason why this field has been so much fun, because it has demonstrated that our theory for planet formation, maybe it's too strong to say that it was wrong, but it was incomplete. There, the range of possible outcomes turns out to be much wider than was anticipated based on that theory. So, if the solar system had a planet just like the one around 51 Pegasi, where would it be? Where would we put it on this map? Well, it would be really difficult because the map is too, we have to zoom way in here in order to see it. Okay, so let's do that. Zoom in. Now we're looking at the inner solar system. So we got Mars, here's Mercury, Venus, the Earth. 51 Pegasi, if the Sun had an identical planet, would be like that. Okay, so. Uh, not so creatively, these, this category of planets has become called hot Jupiters. Okay? They are big, massive planets, presumably gas giants like Jupiter or Saturn, but they are very hot because they are right next to the star that they orbit. Okay, here comes another surprise. Here comes another uh, early discovery in exoplanet science that nobody had quite predicted. This is a chart, again showing the speed of the star against time. Uh, and the gray dots are the data points. But we don't see the same kind of wavy, nice pattern that we saw before. Something weird is happening. Okay, So over here, the star is rushing away from us at 600 meters per second. Then it decelerates over the course of a month or so. It comes to a stop and starts moving away from us, and then starts accelerating in the other direction. And then this day, jams on the brakes, it puts the accelerator in the other direction, and there's this huge spike here before it all repeats. Okay, so what is going on here? Is this a planet? Is this something else? It's a planet, yes, very good. The thing is, its orbit is not even close to being a circle. It is highly elliptical, with the star at one end of the orbit. So I'm going I'm to start the planet moving here. And because the force of gravity gets stronger when the two bodies get closer together, every time the planet and star get close to each other, they pull on each other very hard, causing both bodies to move very fast. So here we're seeing the planet move, but what you have to remember is the star is also moving. It's imperceptible on this scale. It's also moving, doing the same kind of motion, and that's why we see this jerkiness. These spikes are when the planet and the star approach each other closely. So the lesson here is that the orbits don't have to be circular. And this is one of the most extreme examples, but we've seen that there's a much broader range for the shapes of orbits than had been expected, again, from our theory for planet formation. Okay. That's what I wanted to say about the Doppler method. That's probably responsible for 400, 450 of the known exoplanets out of the total of 5,500. The next method I want to describe is responsible for most of the rest, about 4,000. It's very much the here and now of this field. Our main source of information these days comes from the second method. And this method is based on eclipses, which we've already heard a little bit about tonight. 
Um, some of you have, may have traveled or will travel to see an eclipse, a total solar eclipse. Absolutely spectacular, right? Suddenly the moon goes in front of the sun, rim to rim, blotting it out, punching a black hole in the sky. Just unbelievably uh, amazing. Okay. There are other types of eclipses, though, that are not quite as dramatic. Here's one that took place, uh, earlier I said this was 2014, but I think it is actually 2012. Okay, so this is a movie from June 6th, 2012. that took place over the course of about eight hours, I think. That little black dot there, that's Venus, making one of its rare passages directly in front of the sun, so-called transit of Venus. They're very rare. I think the next one is not for more than 100 years, okay? But they do happen. And surely the same, I mean, if you had been out on that day, nothing dramatic would have happened, right? Somebody has to tell you that this is happening and then give you special equipment for you to see this, okay? Um, however, if you, if you did somehow have a measuring device that could track the radiation from the sun, you could have uh, figured out that this was happening because it got fainter by a little bit that day because Venus was blocking a small part of the radiation that usually reaches us from the sun. So surely the same kind of thing must happen every now and then, even for planets and stars that are so far away that they just appear as a single point of light in the sky. If there is a planet transiting across the face of that star as viewed from our direction in the galaxy, we can tell it's there by monitoring the brightness of the star. Every time the planet wheels around and blocks the star, we see a little divot in the measured brightness of the star because of that blockage. And we've gotten very good at measuring the brightness of stars as precisely as possible. So this gives us another way to detect exoplanets that doesn't rely on seeing it in an image, but just relies on our ability to measure the brightness of a star as precisely as possible. Okay, so now, again, I'm going to show you some real data for a particular star called Kepler-22. It's actually at the center of this image. I think it's this star right there. Okay. So here's Kepler-22. Another chart. This time we have brightness against time. And the, the way this works is that one a unit brightness means the ordinary brightness of the star. And this looks kind of boring. <laughs> it doesn't look like there's anything going on. The star is evidently not varying at all. But that's just because we're not looking hard enough. The star is varying, but just very, very slightly. We have to zoom way in on these data points in order to see that. So in the next chart I'm going to show you is going to have a different axis that's just concentrating on this, these tiny variations around one. So we've gotten so good that we can measure the brightness of a star to the fourth decimal place using telescopes in space above the Earth's atmosphere makes it much easier to achieve this kind of precision. And when you do so, you see, yeah, the star is basically constant in brightness, but there are these two dips here. Those are significant, and those are transits of a planet around this star. And I'm, not, I'm only showing a portion of the data, but this keeps repeating, keeps repeating. So we know that it's a planet going around the star. We can measure two things now. We can measure how much light is blocked, in this case, it's about 0.05%. That tells us the relative size of the planet's silhouette compared to the disk of the star. So if we know the radius of the star, if we, if we know what kind of star we're dealing with, we can calculate the size of the planet. In this case, it comes out to be about twice the size of the Earth. That's not so big. We're probably dealing with a terrestrial-type planet here as well. The other thing we can calculate is the time between these dips, which comes out to be about 290 days in this case, that's not so different from the Earth's orbital period, 365 days. So evidently, this is another case where we have a roughly Earth-like planet in a kind of an Earth-like orbit. In fact, it is also in the habitable zone of this nearby sun-like star. And so what did the press release look like? Here it is, right? Here's the planet. Now, of course, this too is fiction. We have no idea if this planet has clouds or continents or oceans. All we know is the size, the orbital period, and we can calculate a few other things using our knowledge of physics. So, as you've seen, 
The knowledge we get about any one planet is sometimes meager. Nevertheless, we have managed to learn a lot, as I'll show you uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Okay. Here's another very important discovery of a of transiting exoplanet. It's Kepler-11. I think this is one of the most important discoveries that, that we've made so far, in fact. So what's going on? First of all, we see that, again, we are measuring changes in brightness very precisely at the fourth decimal place. We see some nice dips, but they don't all look the same. Right? This one's bigger, and the intervals between them are not the same either. So this seems kind of more erratic, more, more random. So what is this all about? What is going on here? We have more than one planet. In fact, there are six planets all going around the star, all transiting on their own schedule. So what we were looking at there are the transits of different planets. That's why they appear different. With enough data, you can tell that there are six periodic trains of these dips that are superposed. But if you only have a little bit of data, it can be very confusing. So eventually it was worked out. There are six transiting planets, and they all have teeny tiny little orbits. So all of these planets have orbits that would be interior to Venus's orbit around the Sun. In fact, five of them are inside of what would be Mercury's orbit around that star. So this is a compact, miniature little solar system. So that's it. And another interesting thing is because they're all transiting, all of the orbits probably are pretty well lined up, just like in the solar system. So in this respect, this is an example of a case where planet formation theory found support in our discoveries of exoplanets. A lot of these systems are flat, like the solar system. But the reason I said this is one of the most important discoveries is not that. It's because these are, turn out to be very common. If you pick a random star like the Sun, there's something like a, at least a one chance in three that it has one of these. So there are a lot of stars in the galaxy that have these teeny tiny little solar systems, and those were not anticipated in the theory of planet formation. In fact, taken literally, that theory would have ruled out the existence of these very compact, tightly packed planetary systems. So another surprise that uh, came up because of, uh, of these uh, discoveries of transiting planets. Okay. Now, uh, this kind of planet is not very common. It's very rare, actually, but I, but I love them. Okay. This one's called Kepler-78. By now, we've gotten used to seeing these very, very tiny changes in brightness against time. You see these nice dips here. Those are transiting transits of the planet. Two really interesting things. One, look at the time axis. This is now hours, not days. So this planet goes all the way around the star in about eight and a half hours. So you... In, in one night's good sleep, the planet goes all the way around. It experiences a whole year in that sense. So this is a really absurdly tiny orbit. This, this planet is almost as close as it is physically possible to be before being destroyed by either the, the star's heat or the star's gravitational field. So the mere existence of these planets, even if they're rare, raises some questions. Like, what is it doing there? Probably didn't form there. It's too hot. All of the normal materials that would have condensed to form a planet would have vaporized. But if it did spiral in from somewhere else, why did that happen? And then why did it stop just short of falling onto the star? Okay. We don't know the answers to these questions. Again, that's part of the fun of being in this field. So that's the first interesting thing, is the extremely short period. The second interesting thing, I bet some of you have already noticed, there's a second dip here. Right? Maybe you're not sure if it's statistically significant, but it is. It is. There is a second dip there, and we know what's going on. What we have to imagine is something like this. We cannot see this, but we can see when the planet goes in front. I'll let it come around again. When the planet goes in front of the star, that's those, those dips there that we can see. So here it comes back again. We're going to get a transit. But then after the transit, the hot, illuminated side of the planet comes into view. And we don't, in our images, all of this light is combined. What we're tracking here is the total light of the whole system. So the light from the planet contributes to the signal and causes the light to rise a little bit. But then, I'll let it come around again. So here's our transit. Now we see the hot, glowing day side. And then, we lose it. That's that second dip. 
that's when the planet goes behind the star. And the reason this is cool is that this tells us the size of the planet. If we then measure this, we know how bright the planet is. We know how brightly it is glowing. That allows us to calculate the surface temperature of the planet. That's another number we can get, another third number. And that surface temperature comes out to be thousands of degrees, well above the melting point of all the common rocks and minerals uh, of the terrestrial planets, at least in the solar system. So now we have these three numbers. We have the size of the planet, we have its orbital period, we have the surface temperature, which is very hot. We hand those over to our friends, the space artists, and this is what they tell us the planet looks like. Right? These are sometimes called lava worlds. This is, this is our Mustafar-like planet because you know, we have no direct evidence like this, but it's very plausible, in fact it seems inevitable, that the side of the planet facing the star is so hot that it is molten. And so you have this planet-wide ocean of, of lava. Okay, while we're on the subject of the Star Wars worlds, this is another uh, one of my favorites. This one's called Kepler 1647. Uh, ignore this bottom part for a minute. Just look at the top. We have brightness versus time. And we have these dips, these nice sharp dips, but they look different, right? These are deep. This dip takes us down to only 80% of the star's usual brightness. That's, that's way too much to be a planet. A planet would not block nearly so much light. And if you look at it, it looks like these dips kind of alternate in size. So that's weird. And then if you look really closely, if you zoom in here, and that's what this bottom panel is, you can see there is a kind of planet-looking dip here, a dip by, by only two-tenths of a percent. Okay, so what is going on here? Why does this look so different from, from the others? Well, what's going on is wonderful. What we have is a pair of stars, a binary star. We have a yellow star and we have a red star. We are viewing it from the side. And so we see these stars eclipse each other. The red star goes in front of the yellow star. The yellow star goes in front of the red star. That's what explains those big dips. But then in addition, there is a planet whose orbit is looping around both objects. And every time that planet comes around, it transits both stars. And we can see those smaller dips in the data set as well. So this is a, called a circumbinary planet, a planet whose orbit surrounds a pair of stars rather than one star. Of course, another nickname for them is the Tatooine planets, right? There really are planets in the galaxy where you could watch a double sunset. They don't even seem especially rare. They're harder for us to detect because the signal is more complicated, but in the cases where we have searched, it seems like they're pretty common. As long as you're far enough away from the binary star so that you you don't feel so much the fluctuating gravitational force from the moving objects, there's, there's plenty of planets. So that's interesting. Now, you might have noticed uh, the names of our planets are not so creative. A lot of them have just been Kepler followed by some serial number. Uh, there are just too many planets for us to come up with uh, creative, catchy names all the time. But the Kepler part, I can explain. It's not because of Johannes Kepler. Well, it is, but indirectly. More directly, it's the Kepler mission, named after Johannes Kepler. This was a NASA space telescope launched in 2009. Which are, what you're seeing here is an artist's conception of this telescope. It has an opening uh, of a little more than a meter in diameter. Uh, so it's a pretty big, pretty big telescope. It had a gigantic digital camera. And unlike the Hubble Space Telescope or the Webb Space Telescope, which are general purpose telescopes, this had a very fixed singular purpose, which was just to monitor the brightness of hundreds of thousands of stars as precisely as possible, looking for these transits. And it discovered several thousand, including a lot of the weird, interesting ones that I have been describing today. However, all good things come to an end. The Kepler mission ended in 2018, uh, but now we are working on the successor to the Kepler mission the one that David uh, mentioned briefly, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, NASA's successor to the Kepler mission, which has four telescopes instead of one. And each of those telescopes is smaller and has a much wider field of view than the Kepler telescope. So with TESS, we are surveying a much larger fraction of the entire sky. Eventually, we want to survey 
the whole sky, searching the nearest, brightest sun-like stars for transiting planets. And it's been going since 2018. Uh, several hundred planets have been confirmed uh, by using test data, and the current rate of discovery is a few per week are coming out of the data that are being analyzed from the spacecraft. So this is our main fountain of new planets these days, the TESS mission. Okay. So as I've been emphasizing, the amount of information we can get from an individual exoplanet is often kind of limited to just a few numbers. Size, the mass, the orbital distance, temperature. Leaves a lot of questions open that we might have about what those planets are like. And leaves us wondering, well, how can we ever figure out if those planets in the habitable zone are actually inhabited? So how can we do that? How can we make progress? Well, there is a possible way. First, though, let me emphasize how important this is. If you only have the size and the orbital distance, and you, so let's say, again, we were alien astronomers looking back at the solar system, watching the transits of Earth and Venus. Well, Earth and Venus, they're basically the same size. And their, their orbital distances are not too different either. So from a transit point of view, they look very similar. But we know they're totally different. Right? The Earth is kind of a comfy place to live. Venus, less so. Okay? It's way hotter. It's uh, the kind of uh, planet where I think you would melt lead if you were on the surface of the planet. Extremely hot. Why is that? It's because of the atmospheres. They have very different atmospheres. Earth's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen has some oxygen. Venus's atmosphere is almost all carbon dioxide, and it's 100 times more massive than the Earth's. So to understand a planet, we really need to know something about its atmosphere, not just its size. So how can we do that? We use spectroscopy, the same technique that I described earlier, and the existence of these spectral absorption lines, each of which can be traced and identified with a particular substance in the atmosphere of the glowing body, in this case the sun. But we have to adapt it a little differently for exoplanets. We use spectroscopy and we combine it with the transit method. So when a planet is transiting, uh, it's blocking a certain fraction of the starlight, and we can, we can tell that's happening. The star gets fainter. But in addition, if the planet has an atmosphere, if you go up high enough, that atmosphere becomes partially transparent. And so some of the starlight filters through that atmosphere along its way to us. Instead of just being totally blocked, it passes through the atmosphere, and that's what gives us uh, the potential to, to learn about the contents of the atmosphere. Because let's say there's some carbon dioxide in this planet's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide happens to be very absorptive at the special frequency of 4.3 micrometers. So if we were watching the same event, but with, with special glasses that could only allow us to see that wavelength, 4.3 micrometers, at that wavelength, the atmosphere would be very absorptive, and so the atmosphere would look like it was much darker. It's blocking a larger fraction of the starlight. So that's the game. You, you observe these transits, but at lots of different wavelengths, and whenever you see the planet appears bigger at a certain wavelength, you can tell which molecule is doing the absorbing. You can learn about the contents of the atmosphere. Okay. Now, the telescope we have that is really the game changer for this kind of experiment is the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. It was launched in summer of 2021, so it's been going a couple of years, and it is a general purpose telescope. It does everything in astrophysics. People are using it to study all kinds of things. I think something like 15% of the time, though, is going towards the types of observations I just described to try and detect the contents of the atmospheres of exoplanets. It's especially good at that. So here's, here comes some, some real data from the Webb telescope. This is a transit observed by Webb of a star called WASP-39. And so here we see this, is this big dip as the planet moves in front. It drops by about 2%. That tells us we're dealing with a giant planet in this case, something even larger than Jupiter, in fact. And this is as observed at a kind of arbitrary wavelength. But if we tune the observations to that special wavelength, 4.3 micrometers, the data go deeper here. Right? The, the star is fainter at its midpoint here. So it's blocking more light, and that 
That difference here is, in fact, due to absorption by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of this exoplanet. There's another way to look at the data uh, besides this, which is this. So here, I'm dialing the wavelength and looking at, well, what is the minimum brightness that we observe at the midpoint of the transit? And we see that at that special frequency, that special wavelength of 4.3 microns, the, the star gets fainter. That's from the absorption by carbon dioxide. So we've learned that in the atmosphere of this giant planet, there is some carbon dioxide. This has been done now for dozens of giant planets, and we've learned a lot about the atmospheres of giant exoplanets. What we are all anticipating, hopefully, is being able to do this for terrestrial planets, to be able to do it for planets as small as the Earth or Venus, and to be able to tell the difference between those sorts of planets. We can't quite do that yet. This is just very difficult. Even with Webb, we can do giant planets. We could probably do planets the size of Uranus and Neptune. So we're starting to see some data like that. I think it's going to be a stretch to be able to do it for the Earth or Venus, although people will certainly be trying. The reason why this is so highly anticipated, besides the just general interest in atmospheres, is because it might give us an avenue for detecting life, or at least for getting a clue that there might be life on a particular planet. The reason is this, so if we were alien astronomers, again, with some version, alien version of the Webb telescope or super Webb, looking back at the solar system, looking at the spectra of these transiting planets, for Venus and the Earth and Mars, in all three cases, we would see the feature from carbon dioxide. But only for the Earth do you see a feature from oxygen. In fact, it's actually ozone. That happens to be easier to detect in an optical spectrum. It's a byproduct of all of the oxygen in our atmosphere. Earth is the only planet with oxygen, and the reason that's interesting is that the only reason we have so much oxygen in our atmosphere is because the plants keep putting it there, or the bacteria, the algae, the photosynthetic creatures are the ones responsible for all the oxygen through photosynthesis. Without them, oxygen is very reactive, and on geological timescales, it would all disappear. It would all react with minerals on the, on the Earth's crust and disappear. So, if we see an Earth-like exoplanet in the habitable zone of its star, and we can see that there's oxygen in the atmosphere, maybe it's because there are exoplants you know, on this exoplanet. Maybe it is because of some photosynthetic-like creature. Okay. It's a bit of a stretch at the moment, not only because we cannot perform these measurements yet, we might need the next space telescope or even the next next space telescope, it's going to, it might be a while, and because the interpretation of these kinds of data will always be open to reasonable doubt. You know, if we see oxygen, does that necessarily imply there's life? Maybe not. Maybe we would need to see multiple lines of evidence for something funny going on in the atmosphere that could plausibly attrib be attributed to life. Nevertheless, it does give us a new way to continue this long-term quest for life elsewhere in the galaxy. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, before uh, everybody falls asleep, I do have a few more things I want to show you. Okay. One of them I think every, everybody on Earth needs to see, which is that, remember I said uh, direct imaging is borderline impossible. We cannot see planets in an image. It's like seeing a firefly when somebody's pointing a searchlight in your face. Well, I was careful to insert that word borderline, okay, because <laughs> It is possible, it has worked in certain limited cases. And I want to show you the most spectacular such case. Okay, so this, this image I showed you before, the glare of the star, it's a real image. It is made for a star called HR8799, okay, it's not a very interesting name, but it's a very interesting star. And what some of my colleagues who are optical engineers and, and uh, are much more clever with instrumentation than I am, have built devices called coronagraphs. The goal is a special kind of camera that blocks the starlight from reaching the camera, but that allows any other light from nearby planets to get through to the image. Okay? I will not try to explain exactly how this works, but the, the gist of it is that here's the opening of the telescope, here comes the starlight, and some lenses in there. You put in some carefully contrived obstacles in the path of the light that have the effect of blocking the light from the central star, 
but allowing any light that comes in a slightly different direction to reach the detector. And that's the way you can achieve a very high contrast. So, with one of these coronagraphs strapped on the telescope, looking at HR 8799, and then after doing a lot of digital signal processing, in addition to correct for the imperfections of the coronagraph, this is the image uh, that was obtained. So this is a little, little uh, takes a little getting used to. The star should be here, okay, but it's been blotted out by the coronagraph. Now the coronagraph is not perfect, the signal processing is not perfect, so you're seeing a little bit of light spilling out from the star. These are artifacts of the optics, not, not actual light sources in the sky. However, you also see this, and that, and that, and that. And those are planets. And if you don't believe me, well, at this point, we've had 15 years of observing this star, so we can make a movie. We can watch these planets orbiting in their solar system, you know, however many light years away. So that's why I said uh, every human being needs to see this. This is the first and really the only so far example of a case where you can just observe an extraterrestrial planetary system and watch those planets loop around. So spectacular. And this, the reason that the, this is a rare, unusual case is because these are very wide orbiting planets. This is the size of what Neptune's orbit would be around the same star. And they're very massive planets, unusually massive, several times more massive than Jupiter. Both of those things make it easier in this case than it is in the case of a system that's more like the solar system. Nevertheless, even though the discoveries have been kind of limited so far, this is going to be the future of this field, at least the far future. It's all very well to, to do these little tricks with the Doppler method and the transit method, but at the end of the day, we want to see these planets, right? We want to see them in an image. We want to be able to get a spectrum of it without all of this uh, trickery involving transits. And so that is why um, the future of this field is heading in that direction. In fact, every 10 years, the astronomical community gets together and elects a kind of blue ribbon panel to decide what are our highest priorities when we are asking for funds from NASA and the National Science Foundation. What do we really, really want? And in the most recent such exercise, the number one priority is to be able to construct a space telescope capable of doing this, but for Earth-like planets. That to be able to do this, but for planetary systems more like the solar system and potentially habitable planets like the Earth. So that's kind of far off, okay? I said these, these committees meet every 10 years, but the things they prioritize tend to get built only after every 20 years or so, okay? The way these things work. So this might be 20, 30 years away, but it doesn't stop people from dreaming and from planning the so-called Habitable Worlds Observatory. This is not something we have now. This is not going to be... So right now we have the Webb Space Telescope. The next big space telescope NASA will launch is called the Roman Space Telescope. It's going to do all kinds of wonderful things. This would be the one after that. Okay? It would be like a super web telescope equipped with a coronagraph that would be able to perform these types of observations. And here, just to kind of whet our appetites, is a simulation of what this telescope would be capable of. If you were 40 light years away from the solar system, equipped with the Habitable World Observatory, what would you see? Well, you'd see the sun's light has been blotted out, but you'd see Jupiter quite easily. You might see Venus peeking out here, and you would get to see the Earth as a pale blue dot in the, worlds of, in the words of, of Carl Sagan. So that would be a very special moment. It's a little far off, so we need to all take care of our health, you know, and make sure we're around uh, to be able to enjoy this. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for your attention. And I'll be very happy to take any, any questions that you might have. A little bit more light here. And do we have some questions for our speaker? Let's see here. Anybody?
I think everybody, right there, yeah. Yeah, um, so I just noticed in the, in the graph when you were de detailing the differences between the consistencies of the different atmospheres, like, you know, Venus and Mars and Earth. Right. Uh, I, know, I know that you mentioned the, like, the CO2 and the, and the O3. There's also a point of data of uh, H2O on there. Is that something that is measurable at, in any case at this point in time, or is that also something for the future? Definitely measurable, yeah. So especially if you can, go, if you can do this at infrared wavelengths, you can sense water vapor in the atmosphere. And that has been done for giant planets. So there are a lot of giant planets where we've detected steam, steamy atmospheres. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the way in the back. Yeah, to see those moments where the planet crosses the, the star, you have to look for solar systems that are plain or flat plain too. So this, are those the ones being selected? Yeah, that is a perceptive uh, point. I, I've been saying how great the transit method is, how powerful it is, it does have a really serious drawback. Most planets don't transit. Right? The orbits have to be oriented very close to being edge on so that our line of sight just skims right along those orbital planes. If it doesn't, if it's even a few degrees off, the planets don't go right in front of the star and we see nothing. So the transit method, when it works, is spectacular, but it is blind to the vast majority of planets in the galaxy. Yeah, Chris. Uh, given, given that you, you're assuming, I guess, the systems are rotated uh, to us randomly. Yes. You can make some kind of a calculation about what you think the average ex the incidence of planets around other stars would be. What kind of That's numbers right. are they tossing around? Right. So you can, in addition to just looking for planets, you can try to do the statistics. You can try to take a census. How many stars did I search? How many planets did I find? And, and take ratios to try to figure out the probabilities. So the basic gist of it is that I'll confine myself to sun-like stars. Um, as I said, there's at least a third of those stars have these miniature solar systems consisting of several planets with sizes in between Earth and Neptune and Uranus. Okay, so those are pretty common. About 10% of them have a giant planet that is pretty close to the star as well, within what would be the Earth's orbit around those stars. So that accounts for, you know, about half of the sun-like stars. For the other half, well, they might have planets, but they're not detectable with our current technology. It's very hard to find a planet when it's smaller than the Earth or when it is further away from the star. All of those things make it harder for the transit and Doppler methods to detect it. So we know that something like half of sun-like stars have the kinds of planets we can detect today. But that leaves the other half, it leaves us wondering about the other half. Hmm. Yeah, time for, yeah, one more question here. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, uh, so you were mentioning before how the, the fact that, you know, the discovery of these kind of larger planets closer to the sun-like stars is contradicting to the kind of yes. general theory. Um, I'm just curious, what are the theories being thrown around about why these are found so close to the sun-like stars? Good, yes. Yeah, so I said we've had these contradictions of planet formation theory. How have the theorists responded? What are they telling us? Well, they did not just rip up the theory and say, ah, oh, we were wrong, let's start over. It was more like, oh yeah, the theory's just fine, but I forgot there's these other things that can happen after planets form. You know? And some of those things involve rearrangements of the planet's orbits. So for example, um, if the planets form and that vortex of, of gas is still present, there is a, an effective frictional force from the planets moving through the gas that can cause them to spiral inwards. So maybe that's where some of these close-in giant planets come from. Or um, if, you, if, if you form a lot of planets, let's say a, 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 a protoplanetary disk forms three or four giant planets and they're kind of close to each other, well, over time they might have close encounters and throw each other around and randomize their orbits. Maybe that's where the really elliptical orbits come from. They used to be circular, but because of these close encounters, that, that kind of messed up their orbits. Mm -hmm. So it's those kind of events that take place after the traditional story of planet formation might explain some of these, these discoveries. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time, everybody. Sure. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us. If, 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 I might have just ten, if I might have just 10 more seconds. Yeah, absolutely. Some of you are ready to go home and are, are done learning about exoplanets. Some of you might want more. 
some of you might want to read about oh, exoplanets. I, oh, that's okay. No, no, I switched over. I was, or, I was gonna... or hear about them. So I have written a book on, yes. on this whole subject. It was just published, The Little Book of Exoplanets. And if you prefer your learning to be uh, video or audio, I've recorded a couple of lecture series for a company called The Teaching Company. They're also called Wondrium. They have a streaming service. So you might check those out if you're looking for a deeper dive. Yeah. And I was going to say, if you're a member of our foundation, you've been emailed details about how to pick up a copy of this book. So, and I recommend that everybody do that. So um, thank you so much. It's been a real thank pleasure. You all. And um, I just want to thank our whole, our, the rest of our panel tonight as well. I want to thank everybody out there on our YouTube audience. Again, tonight's program has been brought to you by Griffith Observatory, the Department of Recreation and, Par of, and Parks in the city of Los Angeles. And we like to thank Griffith Observatory Foundation, our nonprofit partner as well. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And um, I will forward us to our final slides and we'll see you, by the way, we'll see you next month, a week early. It'll be on December 14th. And we have professors Kip Thorne and Leah Halloran joining us again to talk about their book. And of course, Kip Thorne is a Nobel Prize winner. So um, an opportunity to come meet them here in person at Griffith Observatory. Or of course, you can join us on YouTube as always. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month.